Okay. So here's our entire team. I've already presented myself. I'm Maria Alfaro and I'm a community educator. Lisa will be presenting today's um, topic on PPE and we have Sarah on technical support. Katrina will not be with us today, but she also does a bunch of stuff behind the scenes after our presentations have completed. She ensures that the recordings make it onto our YouTube website so that anyone that would like to revisit and review the material, you will get a link to that um, recording. Here's our contact information. Lisa, thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, as Maria said, I'm Lisa Blecker. I'm the Pesticide Safety Education Program Coordinator with UC Statewide IPM Program. And today I'm going to be talking about the proper selection and use of personal protective equipment, or PPE, as we often say for short. <clears throat> so what we're going to go over today is why we wear PPE. Mostly we know that, but a review is always helpful. Uh, what is happening with PPE because of COVID and uh, wildfire demands on our PPE supplies. We're going to have a reminder of the minimum requirements for PPE here in California and how to identify and select the appropriate PPE. And this is before, during, and after COVID. So this, these principles are, are um, their standard principles. And then finally, what to do if you can't find what you normally purchase. So there are four routes of exposure or four different ways, different places where pesticides can enter your body. That's eyes, nose, mouth, and skin. Any guesses as to which of these four routes of exposure are the most common? Tell me in the chat if you think you know. Is it eyes, nose, mouth, or skin? I'm seeing some answers. Thank you, guys. A lot of people say skin, and that's correct. The reason skin is the most common route of exposure is because skin is covering your entire body. It's simply a matter of probability. It's just a higher likelihood that pesticides will absorb onto your skin than, for example, splash into your eyes just because of the surface area covered by skin. Yes, it is the largest organ. So if we look at these four, these are four, this is, um, this model here is Miguel and he is a great model for us. And so you see these, they're actually like four, three squares, I'm sorry, a hand, right? Oops. I did that too fast. But anyways, let me let me just back up and, and, and say this again. So like these body parts are different shades of red. A darker red is an indication of um, higher rate of exposure or higher rate of absorption, right? So the skin on our body is not the same from our hands to our feet, right? There's places in between that are um, thinner skin or more sensitive skin. So our thinner skin is going to absorb pesticides much more quickly and much more easily. So the palm of our hand, for example, it really is going to absorb the minimum amount of pesticides. And so, um, but any pesticide residue that's left on your hand can be transferred to any other part of your body that you touch. Um, the skin on our forehead here is much softer and thinner and is going to absorb much more re readily. And then the skin on our genitals, covering our genitals, this is true for men and women, is going to absorb pesticides the quickest, okay? So this is all under, underscoring our need for, pest, for um, protection from pesticide exposure through PPE, okay? So we use various types of personal protective equipment to protect us from pesticide entry through all four of these routes. Some protect through for our nose and mouth, some protect our skin. Um, many of these protect our skin. Um, things like goggles and safety glasses will protect pesticide against pesticide entry through the eyes. So um, in general, this is what is happening with PPE during COVID. The good news is PPE supplies are not as scarce as they were at the very beginning of COVID. 
So N95 respirators, which are pictured here, well, one's an N95 and one is a P95, um, but the supplies of both are essentially the same. So these filtering face piece respirators that only offer filtration, they are the most limited because they're really, uh, they're really used by healthcare workers to protect against COVID because of their filtration abilities. Sometimes we see people in the general public wearing them, and then also they do protect against inhalation of wildfire smoke. So you can imagine all of these additional pressures on the N95 or filtering face piece supplies. Um, but in May, we were told disposable respirators, these filtering face pieces, were back ordered until July. They were not even taking new orders until July. That's what they said in May. Um, but a recent update is that back orders are currently being filled. Stock is still low. If you order 10, you might get five, like 10 boxes, you might get five. So um, other PPE supplies are either in stock or stock changes frequently. So the most limited supply is going to be those disposable filtering face piece respirators. Um, and so things like chemical resistant gloves, face shields, coveralls there, um, stock will change frequently, but they're not as hard to find. There's more different options for those types of PPE. So here are the rules. If you cannot find the appropriate PPE or the PPE that you normally purchase, okay? If the PPE you need for a particular application is not available, you need to seek alternative, more protective PPE. Do not seek alternative, less protective PPE. You can always increase your level of protection. Or you have another option, seek alternative pesticides that do not require the PPE you don't have. So if you have a pesticide that you're going to apply or handle, or an employee working for you is going to handle, and it requires some specialized PPE, for example, a filtering face piece respirator, or certain, uh, or a face shield for mixing and loading, um, you can seek out an alternative pesticide that requires fewer um, elements of PPE. Okay, so there's a comment in the chat that says go to Mercedes Scientific based out of Florida, you can order lots of N95 NIOSH approved masks. NIOSH approved is very important and we'll talk about all of the specifics of PPE that you need to be looking for. But basically our tips for finding PPE is one, look for reusable options because if you're not throwing them away and rebuying, for every use, it's they're going to there are going to be more supplies, and also look at different brands and distributors. So just exactly like Adam was suggesting in the chat, Mercedes Scientific. That's not where I would normally buy PPE, but hey, they have what I'm looking for. So you need to serve, seek out other distributors. And for example, if you are used to wearing a Tyvek branded coverall and you can't find those, look for a different brand. Okay. So the more popular brands may be sold out, but the lesser known brands, not necessarily, okay? And so now I really want to get into the nitty gritty of how you know what PPE to wear. So we'll go through all those details and then at every step we'll review some ideas or alternatives for you guys. So I want you to tell me in the chat, how do you know what PPE you have to wear for a particular application? All right, I'm getting some responses that say read the label, which obviously I agree with, okay? I just wanna be clear, you always read the label. So Edward provided some information about seeing the data sheet, so the safety data sheet. And for a pesticide, you would follow the label as your primary document. You wouldn't necessarily follow the safety data sheet PPE list because it may not be exactly the same. So if you have a pesticide label, that's what you use to choose your PPE. Um, and we use our SDS for other things. So with other chemicals, SDS is, is your primary document. But for pesticides, let me be clear, the EPA, US EPA registered pesticide label is the primary um, source for what PPE you wear. 
but we're also in California and some of our regulations are more stringent than what the label requires. Okay, somebody said I talked to my PCA. You know what, that's a great source as long as you trust your PCA to know what you're supposed to be wearing. They know how to read the label and they also need to know what the California Code of Regulations say. So I just want to point out that the label is the law, so you have to wear what it says, but sometimes it doesn't say enough and you have to look to the California Code of Regulations. So I'm going to help you marry those two sources of information. So let's launch poll number one, minimum PPE. So in California, most pesticide handlers have to wear a minimum of what personal protective equipment? So you can choose more than one response. Um, waterproof gloves, chemical resistant gloves, maybe a respirator, long pants, long sleeve shirt, closed toed shoes, socks, protective eyewear, or chemical resistant boots. Also, I wanted to point out that there's someone in the chat who posted a question asking, the label almost never specifies the filter required for respirators. Does it or correct? Um, so that's a, that's a great question um, about the label specifying the filter. And we'll talk about filters when we get to respirators. So I'll make sure to address that. It, it does, it's not usually very super specific, but I'll give you some context clues. Um, the poll is where, so paint stores such as Sherwin-Williams or Kelly Moore are also good alternative sources for PPE, but also just make sure to verify that you've got the correct PPE and we'll get into that. So I'll, I'm gonna go ahead and end the poll. Um, so it looks like, um, so I want to make sure that you know that in addition to what the label says, we have to follow the California Code of Regulations, section 6738. Um, and it has some specific things to tell you about protective eyewear, chemical resistant gloves, and coveralls. So let's look at the poll. So waterproof gloves, typically not what we're looking for. What we're looking for are chemical resistant gloves, but the chemical resistant gloves are also waterproof. So if your label says waterproof gloves, Really in California, you need to be wearing chemical resistant gloves, but they are waterproof. So don't worry about that. So chemical resistant gloves is essentially a minimum in California. Respirator, not always a minimum, only if the label says. Long pants, long sleeve shirt, socks and closed toed shoes, always the minimum, okay? Uh, protective eyewear is the minimum in California and chemical resistant boots are only required if the label indicates. So here we've got Miguel, and he's wearing a long sleeve shirt, long pants, socks, and closed toed shoes. So maybe a pesticide label says that that is all the PPE you need, but he does not, he is not wearing the minimum for California. For most handling tasks, employees must also wear protective eyewear and chemical resistant gloves. And in some cases, we also have to wear coveralls. And in those cases, it's when the pesticide label has a signal word that is either warning or danger. That means in California, we add coveralls. So this is just a real quick look at why you should wear PPE, okay? So what is this guy doing? It, is, it looks like he's making a backpack sprayer application on weeds on the border of a field. So he's wearing long sleeve shirt, but it's rolled up, so that doesn't fit the minimum. He's wearing long pants. I do believe he's wearing socks and closed toed shoes, but he's not wearing protective eyewear and he is not wearing gloves, okay? And so he would not be compliant with the minimum requirements for California. So we looked at pesticide illness surveillance program. Um, they have a database where people report pesticide illness. And so we looked at occupational handlers. So people who are handling pesticides as part of their job. This is true for, this is a combined data set for ag and non-ag, okay? So they looked at all the handler illness claims and 55% of them involved eye injury, either alone or in combination with some other injury. 
So 55% of the illness claims were to your one of at least one of your two eyeballs. Okay. 28% of the handler illness claims involve skin injury. Okay. So either alone or in combination with another injury. And basically one third of all handler pesticide illnesses were due to failure to wear PPE. So somebody wasn't wearing the right PPE. So that means that if out of every three handler illness um, report, one of those times we could have completely prevented that illness by wearing the appropriate PPE. So I mentioned before that eye protection, chemical resistant gloves, and sometimes coveralls are added to the list of minimum PPE in the California code. And so here is the basics, the, here's the nitty gritty of eye protection. So protective eyewear means safety glasses, goggles, or face shield, okay? All three of these qualify as protective eyewear. They have to be at least Z87.1 compliant. Most of the time I see Z87 plus, and I do have verification that plus is bigger than one. So if it's a Z87 plus, then you're golden. And it has to have front side and brow protection. So here's the thing with protective eyewear. Well, I'll tell you that in a second, hold on. So this is what I mean by Z87.1 or Z87 plus. So it's just, it's a measure of impact resistance. And so there will be raised lettering on top of your protective eyewear, whether it's glasses, goggles, or face shield. And so I think you can see it here, but it's clear letters on top of clear plastic. So not the easiest thing to find. Mm -hmm. And there are other letters raised on your glasses or on your goggles for other certifications. So you need to be very clear that you can see the Z87 plus to verify that these are appropriate safety glasses and not just something like um, sunglasses or something. So um, here is a label with an example label statement. So it says, this is the PPE that you need to wear. Long sleeve shirt, long pants, chemical resistant gloves made of any waterproof material such as, and it gives a list, socks, shoes, and then it's blank after that. It does not mention protective eyewear at all, but if you were an employee handling pesticides in California, you would need to wear protective eyewear. So you would either wear glasses, goggles, or face shield, depending on what you're doing. It doesn't say anything about protective eyewear, but you still have to wear it. And here's another example. So it says the PPE statement on this label says coveralls, chemical resistant gloves made of, and then it lists them, chemical resistant footwear, and then goggles or face shield. So in this instance, the label is very specific about the type of eyewear you have to wear. So you cannot wear safety glasses with this particular pesticide because it specifically said goggles or face shield. So if your label doesn't say anything about protective eyewear, you get to choose glasses, goggles, or face shield. Or if it doesn't say, if it doesn't say anything, you get to choose. Or if it simply says protective eyewear, you also get the choice of one of those three. But when it says something very specific like goggles or face shield, that is the type of eyewear you must wear. So if the specific prote eye protection is listed on the label, you have to follow those instructions. But if nothing is specified, you choose. And safety glasses can be found, okay? The one thing that is maybe in shorter supply is a face shield because those are used by healthcare workers. And so if you are required to wear a face shield because of the pesticide that you're handling and you cannot find a face shield, the option is not to not wear a face shield. You must wear either a face shield or something more protective or you must apply a different pesticide. So a full face respirator is equally if not more protective of your eyes than a face shield, goggles, or glasses. So a full face respirator, if you are fit tested for it and medically cleared to use it, it can, it can substitute as your regular protective eyewear if you can't find that. So now we're gonna talk about chemical resistant gloves and we're gonna uh, launch a poll. When choosing chemical resistant gloves, what must you do? 
follow the label and wear the chemical resistant material stated on the label. Always wear liners underneath the glove. Make sure there are 14 mils or thicker or never wear disposable gloves. So you can choose more than one answer if more than one is correct. And 96% of the respondents said that you have to follow the label and wear the chemical resistant material stated on the label. That's absolutely correct, okay? Um, and you also need to make sure there are 14 mils or thicker. You can wear liners underneath the glove. You aren't required to. You can if they follow certain rules. And there are some cases also where you can wear disposable gloves. So the two correct answers were follow the label and make sure that your gloves are 14 mils or thicker in most situations. Okay. So what I mean by chemical resistant gloves is gloves made of one of these eight materials. So EPA has um, commissioned a lot of studies on barrier or like uh, the, basically the protectiveness of different glove materials. Okay, so some pesticides are going to eat through certain glove materials faster than others. That is why it is very important for you to follow the specific statements about gloves on the label. Okay, so this is an actual like a wallet sized card, hard plastic like laminated um, that DPR, the Department of Pesticide Regulation has developed and it's very helpful if you need to remind yourself what materials are chemical resistant or if you have a label with a code on it, okay? So laminate, butyl, nitrile, neoprene, natural. Natural is short for natural rubber, okay? It doesn't mean natural fabric. It very specifically means natural rubber because many of these materials are synthetic rubber. So they just needed to shorten it, I guess. So don't be confused with like any natural fabric. This is natural rubber polyethylene, polyvinyl chloride, or Viton, okay? So two of these materials do not have to be 14 mils or thicker. So it's laminate and polyethylene are like those crinkly gloves. I probably have some in here. Like there's, I call it like the barrier laminate are the silver ones and then I call them the spaceman gloves because they go <laughs> when you move your fingers, okay? Those are not required to be 14 mils or thicker because they're very protective. They're a barrier material. But all the rest of these materials, so like nitrile, they have to be at least 14 mils or thick, thicker. So how do you measure glove thickness? Do you, can you get out a ruler and measure mils? Because it's not a millimeter, it's mils. It's its own measure of thickness. So if you look at this Gempler's catalog and wherever you purchase your PPE, you should be able to get all of this technical information. So if you look at Gempler's, it, it has like a two page detailed spread just on the nitrile gloves. So this particular pair is 13 inches long, right? And it's 15 mils thick, okay? And you know it's nitrile because it says it up here. Okay, so you can, when you purchase your personal protective equipment, you get to look at all the specifications. And then the PPE comes in the mail and all the specifications are not printed on the green glove. These green gloves do not say nitrile anywhere on them and they do not say 15 mils thick. They absolutely do not say it. So you need to just be aware that you know what you're purchasing and make sure it's clear to the people using the gloves what the specifications are because it's not printed on the glove. And I need to just go back and, and point out one thing. So if sometimes you have a label that says chemical resistant gloves in category A, and then you need to go here to this decoder card and category A means laminate, butyl, nitrile, neoprene, natural. So it means all numbers one through eight, right? It's an inclusive category. But if you had a label that said chemical resistant gloves in category G, you would go to your decoder card G and you know that you can only use laminate gloves or Viton gloves, okay? You can't wear nitrile gloves if your label says category G, okay? So keep that in mind. Not all labels are going to say it. Um, and again, here's more details that I get from the Gempler's catalog. They have the same type of information online. This is a paper catalog. 
um, and they tell you all about the natural rubber gloves, the neoprene gloves. So you should be able to know the specific material and the specific thickness and whether or not there's a liner on the gloves. Okay. So can you wear disposable gloves? Tell me in the, tell me in the chat, can I wear a disposable nitrile or neoprene glove? Cause I know that those are out there. Tell me yes or no, or tell me what the rules are. Okay, somebody says yes and somebody says no. Who's gonna be the tiebreaker? Somebody says yes. Ah, aha, uh -huh. yes, if there are 14 mils or thicker. Well, here's the thing. There are some specifications. So if you are making fine adjustments to equipment or doing other activities that require high dexterity and motor control, you can wear disposable gloves, okay? It has to be one of those materials I listed on the decoder card. Usually you're gonna find nitrile or neoprene, okay? So they have to be made of a chemical resistant material. So if they are less than 14 mils thick, you cannot wear them for more than 15 minutes at a time, okay? And then as soon as you spill something on them, you rip them or take them off, they get thrown away. Okay, so you can only use them once. You cannot do a five mil nitrile glove three times. You can't put three gloves on. That is not the same as 15 mils thick, okay? So if you can use something that's less than 14 mils thick, but only if you wear it for a maximum of 15 minutes at a time. But I do have these gloves. I found these gloves. They're a 15 mil nitrile glove. So since they are at least 14 mils thick, you, there's no 15 minute time frame, right? So if they have the proper thickness, you can just wear them, okay? But these ones do not have the appropriate thickness, so they cannot be worn for more than 15 minutes at a time. So here are some label examples with chemical resistant gloves. So the PPE statement says long sleeve shirt and long pants, we know that. And it says chemical resistant gloves made of, and it tells you very specifically which materials you can wear. You can wear any of these. If you like Viton because they're more comfortable, wear those as long as they're 14 mils or thicker. Remember barrier laminate, you don't have to worry about the thickness. Um, okay, so if your label gives you a specific glove material, you just wear one of those, but it has to be the adequate thickness. Your label is not always going to tell you the thickness. This particular one does, but most labels do not indicate thickness. That is in the California Code of Regulation. Um, so what would happen if your label said something like, it, it just didn't include chemical resistant gloves in the PPE statement? Would you still have to wear chemical resistant gloves even if the label didn't say it? Tell me in the chat. Yep, everybody says yes. So even if the label does not require gloves, you still have to wear them because we are in California and we follow the label and then we add the California Code of Regulations on top of the label requirements. So, Nitro gloves are most commonly used and they can be found. Um, the disposable 15 mil nitrile gloves are harder to find. You know, those are the ones that fit tighter on your fingers and your hands. And so you get more dexterity with them, um, but they're disposable, but they're 15 mils. But those are harder to find right now. But uh, materials like Viton right here and barrier laminate are almost universally protected. Like if you went back to that decoder card, pardon me, right? So on every single one of these barrier laminate, every category barrier laminate is protective enough. And almost every category Viton is protective enough, okay? So just keep that in mind. Um, why wouldn't somebody just always have Viton and barrier laminate on hand instead of nitrile? Why do you think? How much do you think these Viton gloves cost? Sometimes they cost $80. Sometimes they don't. I mean, they. it just depends on where you get them. And barrier laminate is not super expensive, um, not as expensive as Viton, but they don't allow for a ton of dexterity. 
So this is a poster that DPR put out and it helps, it gives you some tips for handling gloves selection for handling pesticides, particularly in the time of COVID. They basically said, if you use, you know, reusable, basically they say, follow the label in the California code. You still have to wear chemical resistant gloves. Look, you know, here's, here's the decoder key. Um, most of them have to be at least 14 mils thick. So basically, um, the rules for glove requirements are not being softened just because some of them are hard to find. You still have to wear the appropriate gloves. So before I move on to coveralls, are there any questions about chemical resistant gloves? You can go ahead and put your questions in the, in the Q&A or people have been putting stuff in the chat. I got them both open. So let me know if you have a question about chemical resistant gloves or protective eyewear. Okay, I don't see any, but I'll keep checking. So in California, we have our California Code of Regulations section 6738, which outlines the protective eyewear and chemical resistant glove requirements that I mentioned before. But also it says that this is when you have to wear coveralls. Well, in general, this is when you have to wear coveralls, right? If the label states you have to wear coveralls, then you have to wear them. They also must be worn when handling pesticides with the signal words danger or warning, okay? So that's a California requirement. This one right in the middle is a California edition. And here's another thing. They should be worn if a handler will come into contact with spray. So for example, if you're on a, an open tractor doing an air blast spray, right? There is spray probably falling on your person. And so if that's true, that person should be wearing coveralls, okay? Even if the label doesn't say, and even if it's not danger or warning because their, their clothing should not get soaked by pesticides. Same situation here with the backpack sprayer. Many people tell me that the backpack sprayer leaks. So if that backpack sprayer is gonna leak down your back, wear coveralls. Do not allow the pesticide to soak into your clothes and touch your skin. Um, so Alex has a question about eyewear. He says, what about Z87? They don't qualify, correct? So if they just say Z87, then it's not up to the standard. So that used to be the standard. Now the standard is Z87.1, but Z87 plus is even more protective than that. So your eyewear needs to say Z87.1 or Z87 plus. So he, going back to coveralls, here are the rules. Try different brands. Like if you can't find the coveralls you normally wear, for example, the disposable Tyvek branded coveralls, try different brands. Reusable coveralls are a good option, okay? You can use different brands of the disposable, but these cotton coveralls, they, unless your label says chemical resistant suit, if it just says coverall or if a coverall is required because of the signal word, a tightly woven cotton fabric is a coverall. Okay, this coverall, it is fine. It is compliant. But here's the thing. If your employer provides coveralls like this, the reusable kind, they must also provide you with clean coveralls. You're not to take those coveralls home to your personal washing machine or to the laundromat and wash them yourself. So if you need coveralls, um, again, try the reusable ones, okay? Because then they're always available and you're not having to completely rebuy supplies over and over again. But a chemical resistant suit is more protective than a coverall. So if you can't find coveralls, you can wear a chemical resistant suit. Okay, you also just have to be very cognizant of heat related illness because these breathe even less than coveralls. They're not designed to breathe. They're a barrier material. So it could, um, you know, it will increase your body temperature because it doesn't breathe. So keep that in mind. So um, I'm looking at a label example and it says, uh, protective eyewear, here's the PPE statements, protective eyewear, 
coveralls over long sleeve shirt and long pants, socks plus shoes, chemical resistant gloves, and then they specify a category, okay? So coveralls are required by this label. So you have to wear them, whether they're Tyvek, whether they're a tightly woven cotton, or you could even up your level of protection and wear a chemical resistant suit, okay? So I'm gonna give you this example. So here's Miguel, okay? We're gonna determine if he's got the right, you know, uh, PPE. So it says long sleeve shirt, long pants, socks plus shoes, right? We got it. We also have to add protective eyewear, chemical resistant gloves in category A, which is inclusive of all materials, so nitrile is fine, and a dust mist NIOSH approved respirator with any NRP or HE filter. Okay, somebody was asking about filters earlier. Here is your clue that this is a filtering face piece because it's requiring an NRP or HE filter. And we'll talk about respirators in just a minute. So this is a P95, P is on here, we got it, okay? So is that all Miguel needs? He has followed all of the label statements. Is that all he needs to be compliant with his PPE requirements? So somebody says no, somebody says he needs a coverall. Coveralls are not on the label, but look, it's a danger poison pesticide. It's danger, or even if it just said warning, he would have to wear that coverall on top of all of this other PPE. And that is a California requirement. Okay, so again, if you can't find the PPE, seek alternative, more protective PPE, right? So goggles instead of glasses, um, chemical resistant suit instead of a coverall, um, seek alternative pesticides that don't require the PPE you don't have. Look for reusable options. Look for different brands and distributors. And this strategy applies to all PPE, including respirators. So this P95, this is a filtering face piece respirator. Filtering face piece respirators are in the shortest supply. If you're if your label requires a filtering face piece, you can wear um, a, this elastomeric respirator. This one has cartridges, but it also has a P95 filter on it, okay? So you can up your level of protection, but you have to be fit tested and medically cleared for any new respirator that you use. So we're gonna launch another poll, uh, poll number three. So if you have questions about what PPE is appropriate to use as a replacement for what you normally wear, who should you contact? Is it your ag commissioner, Cal OSHA, or a healthcare worker? Okay, it looks like most people have had a chance to respond. And the most common response is check with your county ag commissioner. And that's exactly correct. So if you have further questions, maybe something your PCA can't answer or something like that. County Ag Commissioners are there to help you with compliance. Okay, so we've got another poll. Um, so let's launch poll number four. You'll need to see the photos on the screen. If your label requires you to wear a respirator with any NRP filter, which of the following respirators could you wear? Choose all that apply. Could be one, two, three, or four correct answers. So 100% of you said that this is compliant if you need NRP protection, right? That one was true. This one was B. It's a P95. 87% of you said that this is correct. And I agree with you because it says any N, R, or P filter. And maybe you can't see it up close, but it does say P95. And I should have told you that. Yeah, that's compliant. This one is an N95. And look, my label said I can wear an N. So that's fine. And this is kind of a trick. A trick only in that most people, I knew most people wouldn't know the answer, okay? This is actually a powered air purifying respirator. You absolutely can put an N, R, or P filter on it, okay? So any of these would work. 
here's the thing for this one, this one, and this one, those are tight fitting respirators. So before you ever put one on and wear it for handling pesticides, you have to be medically cleared and you have to have a fit test and you have to do that before you wear any of these respirators, okay? So if you're changing your regular respirator because of COVID and you can't find what you normally buy, you have to be fit tested and medically cleared for that. So here's the difference. So, um, hold on, how do I go? Okay, so this is a reusable respirator. It's got cartridges on it and it has a filter in front of it, okay? So this respirator with just the cartridges would not be the correct answer. I happen to know that these have a filter in front. So this is how these work. So here's your face over here on the right side of the screen. And this is the face piece. This is the reusable elastomeric respirator, right? So here we've got a cartridge right here. We've got a filter right here. Like this is the N, R, or P. And this is the clip that holds it all together, right? So air comes through and it gets filtered here. And then it gets filtered here. And then it's clean. It's purified when it hits your face, right? Or your nose or your mouth. So this is a particulate pre-filter. It traps airborne particles, so dusts or mists. This is rated N, R, or P, just like a filtering face piece respirator. Okay, it's got, the, it's the same material, okay? And then this chemical cartridge absorbs gas. This chemical cartridge cannot filter out particles or dust. It only absorbs gas. So the type of filtration you need depends on the pesticide and you have to rely on the label. Okay, so this is a respirator. It says NIOSH on it. NIOSH is a certifying agency, National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. It says NRRP, and that's an indication of its resistance to oil degradation. That's important. It also either says 95, 99, or 100, which gives you an indication of filter efficiency, how good it is at filtering out the dusts and mists. But the thing is, there's not a huge difference between 95% efficient and 100% efficient. There is a huge difference between N and P, and even between R and N, okay? So, this is a filtering face piece. It is a respirator. It's the simplest type of air purifying respirator. It filters out dusts and mists. So particulates and spray droplets, okay? Not gases. And so these cartridges right here, you can see there's black on the cartridge. That is an organic vapor cartridge. Cartridges filter out gases. Filters like this filter out um, particulates and spray droplets. Okay, so these cartridges are color coded, and they also these these particulate filters that the white piece of papery thing that goes on top of the cartridge is also rated N, R, or P. So I told you there's a big difference between N and P. N is not resistant to oil. R is oil resistant and P is oil proof. So P is the most protective. So if your label says any N, R, or P filter, N95 and P95, same difference. But if it says any R or P filter, you can't wear an N95. So you just have to look at the labels, okay? So um, these half face and the full face, they basically filter out the same type of contaminants. It just depends on sometimes a, a pesticide label will require a full face or sometimes somebody has trouble um, getting protective eyewear and their respirator to like really work together. So then they, they switch to the full face. So both of these have a black organic vapor cartridge on them and they have a particulate pre-filter. It's either rated N, R, or P. So if you are looking for particulate filtration, okay? So if you have a label and most of the labels that I look at will say any N, R, or P. That is not a cartridge. You can wear a cartridge, but 
it's not protective against that particular pesticide unless you have this papery filter over it. It's like a thick cottony material, right? So this is your particulate filtration. So if your label says any N, R, or P filter, okay, you can wear these as long as you got the particulate filter. But you can also wear something like this. These are two different brands, but this, this purple is an indication that it is P100 or HE. HE means high efficiency, okay? So you can get a reusable face piece and then put these P100 filters on them without needing an organic vapor cartridge because sometimes you don't need a cartridge and the more things you have on your respirator, the harder it's going to be for you to breathe. I'm just saying, if you don't need a cartridge, then consider buying a P100 filter that goes on a reusable respirator. Okay. Um, I'm not going to talk about these because I look, it looks like I'm running out of time, but these can have N, R, or P filtration as well. Okay. Um, and so uh, a reminder, disposable N95 respirators are difficult to order. Try reusable respirator options or try different brands and distributors. But again, if you, this is a resource from DPR that re reiterates what I'm saying. Um, if you change respirators because you can't find the normal one, you have to repeat your medical evaluation, your fit tests, you have to receive as an employee additional training that corresponds to your new respirator and you have to do it all before you use the new respirator. This is going to require lots of train, like lots of planning, okay? So I've mentioned all of these strategies before. Um, I know the ag commissioners had been given a huge supply or a DPR was given a huge supply of filtering face piece respirators like N95, P95 um, by EPA and they distribute them via the county ag commissioner. I don't know what those supplies look like at the moment if they've distributed everything, but they are a really good resource for you because they might know where some business has lots of extra and where you might be looking for some. So I'm not going to do that quiz. Um, actually, well, because they don't have the thing in there. Okay, so somebody asked a question about how long can you use the pre-filters for the half masks? So I apologize, I don't have this picture. Um, the back of that um, glove card, right? We've got this glove card that I showed you, the decoder card. On the back, it tells you how to know when to replace. So our cartridges are replaced at the end of each day's of work, each day's work. So an organic vapor cartridge, you have to replace it at the end of the work day. So any of those filtering face piece respirators or even the pre-filters that go on top of the OV uh, cartridges, those are single use, okay? you have to replace them at the end of the workday. One note about the R's, if you have an R95, R99, R100, you have to replace them after eight hours or at the end of the workday because they're oil resistant, but they do eventually get gunked up with oil. If you have a lot of oil in your formulation, particularly with emulsif emulsifiable concentrates. So for the most part, it's at the end of a day's work. They are disposable, even the cartridges. We do not use cartridges for two hours one day, two hours the next day, two hours the next day. Once you remove that respirator with the car, you know, once you remove the cartridge from the respirator, it goes in the trash. Same with the filtering face pieces. Okay. So, oh, I forgot to say this. So we're protective eyewear and chemical resistant gloves for all handling activities. Check your manufacturer's specifications for glove thickness. Um, wear coveralls when handling danger and warning pesticides. Filtering face piece, face pieces are called, they are respirators, so they have all the respirator requirements. And if you can't find the PPE you need, you have to look for alternative, more protective PPE. So here are some resources for you, but I know what you're most interested in is, here's a good place to, good, um, methods for contacting us. If you have any further questions, we're going to stay on for a little bit longer, but please follow us on Twitter or send us an email or sign up to um, get notifications when we have future trainings.